Which we've kind of conformed to so far. Okay, so I just want to introduce um, Victoria, who will be presenting this week's Herp of the Week. Over to you, Victoria. Thanks. Um, so this is the pink-tailed worm lizard, Aprasia paraguchella. Uh, the pink-tailed worm lizard comes from the family Pygopodidae, also known as the flat-footed lizards or legless lizards because they have no forelimbs but retain vestigial hind limbs in the form of small scaly flats. The pink-tailed worm lizard sits within the Australian genus Aprasia, which contains 14 species of morphologically conservative worm-like fossorial lizards. Um, Aprasia is a geographically dispersed and highly fragmented group with small populations distributed mostly in uh, mesic temperate areas of Australia that receive high winter rainfall. Um, A. Puchella and uh, these species that are part of the Reapin species group all come from Western Australia, while the rest are more Western Australia and South Australia or Victoria. However, um, Aprasia parapuchella, um, on the other hand, is the most south easterly occurring species of the genus and is distributed along the western foothills of the Great Dividing Range um, from uh, between Bendigo and up near Ganada. It was originally thought to only occur within or close to the AC ACT. However, further surveys began finding them elsewhere, uh, particularly in Bendigo. They inhabit open woodland areas that have ground layers made up of predominantly native grasses, particularly kangaroo grass. Uh, that contain rocky outcrops. Some general information, uh, the pink-tailed worm lizard is relatively small with a maximum total length of 240 millimetres but a weight between 0.1 and 4 grams. Uh, they have a slender body with a blunt head and a rounded tail. Uh, they have dark brown to black head that merges into a grey or um, brown body uh, with a white underbelly. The tail, as their name suggests, is pink uh, which is most likely has a role in reducing predation by drawing the attention of the predators away from the head and body. Uh, not a great deal is known about the reproduction. They are thought to be late maturing and long lived, reaching their adult size at three to four years. Um, there is evidence of sexual dimorphism with females being longer and heavier than males. They are oviparous with females laying two eggs in the, during the summer um, and the first young being observed around March. Uh, not a great uh, deal of uh, studies have looked at their social behaviour. However, some studies have observed in passing uh, two to eight uh, individuals beneath one rock, um, rock sharing. Um, they are most often found beneath small, partially embedded rocks and spend most of their time in burrows underneath these rocks that have been constructed and still occupied by small black ants or termites. Uh, these ant galleries are important foraging and sh shelter sites and they provide the lizard with a thermally stable environment. The worm lizard's preferred food are ant eggs and larvae and they've been found in association with 15 different species of ants and one termite species. One particular favourite is the tyrant ant um, which aggressively defends its nest when disturbed by intruders. However, uh, it is currently not really known what method the worm lizard uses to avoid these attacks from the tyrant ant. Um, However, it's been suggested that it might be related to behaviour or chemical signals. Um, most current research on them has focused on their genetics rather than their ecology. Um, a. Paraputella was the first legless lizard mitochondrial genome published, uh, to be published in 2015. Um, it has also been observed to have 42 chromosomes, the largest among all pygopodids examined so far, and has highly differentiated XXXY chromosomes with the Y chromosome not only being highly differentiated from the X chromosome in morphology, but DNA content as well. Um, now the life history traits and habitat and dietary preferences of the pink-tailed worm lizard does make it uh, particularly susceptible to decline. Uh, it is currently listed as vulnerable under Australia's Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Um, habitat fragmentation and modification are the major threats to the lizard. Uh, this habitat loss is due to urban development, livestock grazing and agricultural crops. Uh, the disturbance of rocks is also thought to be a specific threat as it disturbs their favoured uh, prey species, which could result in the replacement with non-preferred ant species coming in. Uh, it can be difficult to determine kind of population uh, numbers in this species, 
as they are very inactive uh, during the colder winter months, but also burrow quite deep uh, when the temperatures are above 25 degrees. So you've got a small kind of window when you'll be able to find them. Um, and that's about it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Victoria. <laughs> Have we got any questions, comments? I think that's really interesting that the life history traits are really convergent with blind snakes mm. that also utilize, does, I don't know whether they actually live in, um, in ant nests, but they definitely, you know, they're, they're specialists. Yeah. Uh, ant specialists and don't, I think someone else can probably chime in here, but don't they build up some kind of chemical cues based on their, um, consumption of eggs, of, of ant eggs and ant larvae and thing. I thought that was kind of one of the mechanisms that they use to be able to infiltrate ants' nests. Is that does anyone else know true or not? For the blind snakes or the... The, the blind snakes, yeah. Okay, yeah. Did Jono do any of that, Rick? No, I did the... the I mean, Jono cut up the aprasia to get the gut contents and, and gonads, but, yeah, the blind snake stuff, it, everyone has talked about these chemicals that... Leptotyphloppids produce that turn off the attack of the ants, but Jono found out that with the Australian blind snakes, they just have such incredibly thick polished scales that there's nowhere for an ant to get a hold of them. So if, if you throw a blind snake in a small jar with a bulldog ant, which Jono did, and which an ethics committee would never allow you to do today, um, the ant would try to grab the snake uh, and it really couldn't get a grip anywhere. Um, the eyes were the only point of vulnerability and there'd be a bit of thrashing then. So that's presumably why they lost their eyes. They, uh, it's a place that an ant can get hold of. Uh, but yeah, it just seemed to be straight physical. There was a paper just very recently though about blind snakes letting some kinds of snakes into the, into the ant colony that eat blind snakes. Um, so that, you know, the, the, the ants basically encourage the predator of the blind snake to come in without attacking it. So really? there may be, may be some chemical recognition going on there. Wow. What, um, I hadn't heard about that. That's quite It was a month or two ago, and I'm sure it could be easily found on Google Scholar. Um, but it's about, yeah, it's, it's a, just another cute twist in the lives of these virtually unknown little guys. I, I think it's true that the... Um, the convergence between uh, aprasia and pygopoda and uh, and typhlopids is and leptotyphlopids is quite quite astonishing. Yeah, um, maybe Simon B can come back and um, apply his functional morphological skills to this problem. A very good idea. Yeah, that really that's yeah. I'm keen to see this this paper. Anybody else have any? Yeah, I wanted to ask if is there any um, color polymorphism in the tail between the populations in Canberra or something? Do you read about um, that or is it very stable? I'm not too sure. There hasn't been a lot of, like I was struggling to find many papers on these guys. Um, but from, just from all the photos, there is slight, like some have like long, like the pink tails up to here and others are very sh short. Yeah, not too sure. And Victoria, why did you choose, or why did you choose uh, this species? Because I'm from Canberra originally, um, and I wanted to see what kind of cool herps are around Canberra, and this guy kind of popped up. Okay. Yeah. Great choice. And I, yeah, some of the sites where it's been found was actually near my backyard where I used to live, and I was, I'd never seen them when I was younger, so I was like, huh, oh, I may have mistaken them for earthworms. Yeah, that's cool. They kind of just look like earthworms. If you want a story going back in history, when I was an undergraduate student, and we're talking the late 60s here, at Canberra, there was an academic called Dick Barwick, who was the reptile guy. And I finally got brave enough, I think in my second year as an undergrad, to go to Dick's office because I'd never met a real herpetologist. And uh, the lovely guy, I ended up doing my honours with him, but he said, oh, you should go and look for a praise your shit up or Keller um, around uh, on the Malonglo. So I then spent the next couple of months turning over every rock I could find. I never found one of the damn things. Um, I'd seen a couple earlier 
but after Dick told me to go out there and find them for him, um, I completely failed. Wow. Yeah, I've never seen a Lake of Lisa here in this. Have you dug around in any ant mounds, termite mounds? Well, I did lift a lot of things for Cyphus, <laughs> but never, <laughs> never found them. And actually, now that you talk, I saw a lot of Cyphus in bullant nests. Really? Um, yeah. Wow. What do you think is going on there? Mm, I didn't like just wait to see if they were attacked or not. Usually they escaped and I wouldn't put my hand inside the nest. Um, so it's difficult to know if the ants would attack them afterwards. But they were more, mostly, the ants were mostly interested in on me, on my hands, not really in the lizard, but I don't know. We could do some cool experiments, Ivan, where your hand could be the control in a, mm. in this oh, yeah. Um, yeah. scenario. I so. know it hurts, but it goes away <laughs> very fast. So, something. <laughs> Some of the sites in the Brindabellas, the Bassiana uh, lizards would nest under the only big flat rocks, and bulldog ant nests would be there as well. And so you turn that. over a rock, and there'd be a hundred Bassiana eggs. There'd also be a really angry bulldog uh, ant colony. I think wow. they were often actually physically separated. It wasn't obvious when you turn the rock, but if you look closely, it was kind of a couple of little cavities under a single big flat rock. Mm. And so they may not have actually been in contact with each other until you lifted the rock. We never waited to have a close look, basically. Yeah. Yep. I remember in, an, in um, one of, I think it was one of the, the David Attenborough documentary. Uh, and I can't remember whether it was, a, was it, whether it was like a reptilian predator or whether it was a spider, but they had a relationship with ants nests where they would nest in the, in, in the ants nest um, and also predate the ants and the female would move once she selected the nest she wanted to kind of engage with for probably weeks she'd have these non-fatal interactions with ants kind of on the periphery far enough away from the main holes entering the entry of the nest that there wasn't too many workers or soldiers she would have these non-fatal interactions and she would start to build up the ant pheromone through those interactions that so that by the time she actually wanted to get close to the nest hole, she smelt like an ant and they just kind of let her move through. I wonder if these guys do something similar, if they're kind of trying to engage closely with the, with the nest. Could be a good MRES project. Okay. Um, 